It may contain coarse language, sexual references and adult themes. Excited about tonight. Joining us tonight for a bit of stand up, the brilliant and friend of the show, Cassie Workman's going to be here. <laughs> That'll be fun. First up, the news about the Great Barrier Reef. She's been looking pretty hot lately, particularly in ads like this. Hey, Jeremy, is it true you can see the Great Barrier Reef from space? Yeah, how amazing is that? I'd rather see it from down here. All the colours and life. Well, it does stretch for 2,300 kilometres, so... So, we better get started. Queensland, where life's beautiful one day and perfect the next. Except when it comes to closing ceremonies. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, it was pretty shit. Anyway, the reef looks beautiful there. It makes me feel good about this beautiful natural resource we have in this country. How's the reef going now? Cooked to death. <laughs> Cooked to death! The Great Barrier Reef has been cooked to death. That's no way for the reef to go. It was only a million years old. Gone before its time. No! Scientists are warning the Great Barrier Reef may never recover from a catastrophic marine heat wave in 2016. The study published in Nature Today found large sections of the Barrier Reef were cooked with 30% of coral killed in just nine months. Yeah, well, it could be the higher temperatures or it could be the fact that reef experts like Professor Terry Hughes keep bullying the coral. We refer to different species of corals as being relative winners versus losers. Winners and losers? <laughs> Come on, Terry! They're all doing well. All, each polyp gets a participation trophy. No good, Terry. I hate anyone called Terry. Terry! <laughs> I love you, Terry. Professor Hughes said there is hope the reef isn't doomed if we deal very quickly with greenhouse gas emissions. In other words, bye-bye reef, you losers. <laughs> Terrible news, obviously, although you've got to head at the Queensland Tourism. They're really trying to make the best of what they've got. Hey, Jeremy, is it true you can see the Great Barrier Reef from space? Not anymore. It's cooked to death. <laughs> It's so cooked. <laughs> Look, a turtle choking on plastic. The Great Barrier Reef. It was nice while we had it. Oh, beautiful stuff. Thank you, Queensland. I think this show really bums people out. <laughs> Well, still some controversy surrounding rugby star Israel Folau. Seen here waving goodbye to me as I'm sent to hell. <laughs> Thanks, Izzy. See you, mate. Love you. <laughs> you remember he's been in hot water ever since he made comments on social media saying that if gay people don't repent and turn to God, they'll go to hell. The comments were slammed by the queer community and also by Satan, who was quoted as saying, fuck off, we're full. <laughs> Good to know. Rugby Australia has chosen not to sanction Falau, which some might say is odd because their own inclusion policy clearly states that they're committed to doing more to positively promote a culture of respect and inclusion for gay, lesbian and bisexual participants. You know, before they go to hell. <laughs> but... <laughs> <laughs> Guys, everything's fine. <laughs> hey, Izzy, if things don't work out in Union, you're always welcome back at the NRL. NRL CEO Todd Greenberg says he would welcome Israel Falau back to rugby league. Everyone has their own views. Doesn't mean people agree with them. Um, it happens every day in this great game of rugby league. People have their views and um, people have different views. Yeah, no, people have their views, they have those views. Some of them are different views and that's bloody views for you. Yeah, really, just keen to see the boys get out there and get stuck into the views and give 110% and take it one view at a time. Get in there, son! Get your views out there, son! Come on! Come on, viewsy! <laughs> This week, Falau wrote a blog post trying to explain his views, where he's coming from. You see, Izzy Falau, he just wants to help homosexuals, OK? He sees them sinning, he wants to save them from the consequences of their sin. In the post, he explains, I think of it this way. You see someone who is about to walk into a hole and have the chance to save them. <laughs> um, Israel, that's not how being gay works. <laughs> you can't just walk into a hole, OK? <laughs> You've got to woo the hole. <laughs> Maybe buy the whole a few drinks. Use some lube first, at least. You know, common courtesy. 
common courtesy. <laughs> Flowers adamant, though. He says, if you don't tell him the truth, as unpopular as it might be, he is going to fall into that hole. <laughs> oh, honey, I wish it was that easy. Oh, it's been a while. <laughs> Controversy's got a lot of people talking about free speech and uh, religious freedom. Senator Cory Bernardi also believes people like Falau are entitled to their views. And hey, straight Christian people, they suffer from discrimination too. It works the other way, you know. I used to go to a sports, a sports group in the morning and uh, a gay bloke refused to stand the same line as me because I didn't support gay marriage, you know. Mm. Did I call him a, a bigoted heterophobe? No. Did he call me a bigoted homophobe? Yes. <laughs> you hang in there, Cory. <laughs> You keep fighting for your right to force gay men to stand in line with you at your sports group that you no longer go to. Love will win! Love will win, Corey. God, I love that man. Even the treasurer, Scotty Morrison, is supporting Izzy. But he's shown, I think, a lot of strength of character in just standing up for what he believes in, and I think that's what this country's all about. Yeah, it's what this bloody country's all about. Standing up for your belief, the gay people go to hell. Yes! <laughs> That's why a coat of arms is just Anthony Clear and Tim Campbell burning in agony. Yeah! <laughs> because they're flaming! <laughs> Look, I'm no fan of any religious homophobia, whether it's perpetrated by Jewish people or Muslims or Buddhists or the Catholic Church, when they're not having drug fueled gay orgies at the Vatican. <laughs> Man, I gotta go there! <laughs> Sounds like gay schoolies. <laughs> So you're very welcome to have your opinion that gay people are going to the worst place ever forever if they don't stop being gay, but just don't tell me that that opinion isn't offensive to gay people. I think he, would, he, he wouldn't have wanted to intend to have offended or hurt anyone because that's very much against the faith that he feels so passionately about. Yeah, he didn't mean to offend you when I told you you were going to hell because of your sexuality. It was coming from a place of love, a place of straight, <laughs> normal love. <laughs> no homo. <laughs> Moving on. Hey, you guys know what comes out next week? Avengers Infinity Wars! Yeah! Oh, I can't wait. I love supporting independent film. <laughs> Apparently the film has a runtime of 156 minutes, but I'm sure it'll feel like infinity. <laughs> but uh, here's the tricky thing. The movie's being released on Wednesday, which is also Anzac Day, and in a shocking, shocking twist, some people are very unhappy about that. Writing the Daily Telegraph, Paul Ritchie is furious the movie's release date has been moved forward to coincide with Anzac Day because it meant cinema chains were sending the message that the morning of Anzac Day is no longer sacred. I don't know, Paul. Infinity Wars goes for two hours, 40 minutes. Gallipoli only went for two, OK? So... <laughs> I think this Infinity thing's pretty important. <laughs> Fuck it, hell. <laughs> Good luck for the next two minutes, everybody. Here we go. <laughs> Richie's not convinced, though, writing, Remind me to look for the Infinity War section on my next visit to the Australian War Memorial. <laughs> you do that, Paul. You might find it's listed as the War on Terror, so be careful for that. <laughs> <laughs> How long is the show? <laughs> Rich explained that his kids won't be going to see any movies on Wednesday. They'll be commemorating Anzac Day the correct way by going to the dawn service, followed by some hot cakes from McDonald's. <laughs> yes, what better way to commemorate our fallen Aussie heroes than tucking into some American fast food drizzled in Canadian syrup? Mmm. <laughs> Good call. Other people are also annoyed. John Mangos went on today to express his pure rage. They have strategically brought it forward today to take advantage of the fact that kids are not going to school and that, and that parents have got a day off work so that they'll go and watch this ridiculous pissant movie. Sorry to call Whoa. it that. Whoa! Whoa, John. I think you're confusing your Marvel movies. Pissant Man was released last year. <laughs> Real big stuff. Keep going, Johnny! I think it's nothing short of a disgrace. Holidays are called holidays because they are holy day. Yes, John is right. Anzac Day is a holy day? when we celebrate Jesus fighting bravely at Gallipoli with... <laughs> with his donkey. I think, is that right? He had a donkey? <laughs> there was a donkey involved, I think. No. OK, I'm joking. John's right. Movies shouldn't be released on holidays because they're holy days. The worst thing you can do on Christmas Day is to go see a Christmas movie. You watch that shit in June, people! <laughs> but not on the Queen's birthday, don't you dare. What do you think about this, Carl Stefanovic? How on earth are our kids supposed to breathe in the significance of Anzac Day? The sacrifices, the great sacrifices, the impact on our nation, on our families. 
Pretty hard to do with a $25 popcorn and choc top, I would have thought. Mm. <laughs> yes, Carl, it is hard. It's hard to breathe in the significance of Anzac Day with some popcorn and choc top. But if there's one thing the diggers taught me, it's that when things get hard, you persevere. Let's do this! Come on! <laughs> Right, it's fine, it's Turkish delight. It's mine. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. That's inappropriate. No, that's inappropriate. Let's do this properly. Come on. Anzac Day, Mickey, and a beer. Here we go. <laughs> now that's respectful commemoration. <laughs> Billionaire CEO and king of nerds Elon Musk has released a memo to his employees at Tesla with his tips for increased productivity. But do they work? And do they work in any workplace? There's only one way to find out. Tonightly road tests, putting things to the test. Yeah! Rule one, don't have excessive meetings. OK, everyone, I've scheduled this meeting as a precursor to next week's meeting so we can go over the, some of the meeting notes. Now, if anyone has any issues they'd like to clarify or discuss in person, what we can do is schedule an additional meeting to start before the meeting next week. So that's the three total meetings. Could we just have one meeting? Yes! Whoa! That's amazing! Whoa! It's a real test pass! Rule two, don't use acronyms or jargon for objects or processes. Quick, this patient's BP is off the charts. You need to administer CPR immediately. Go get the AF stat. <laughs> CP what? Oh, okay, look, I'm not gonna swallow a glossary of medical terms here, doc. Speak English, I'm out. <sighs> Time of death, 1358. Well, let's roll this fail. Rule number three. Drop off a call as soon as it's obvious you aren't adding or getting value. Hey, I'm just here with the materials. Can you get to the warehouse and sort it with the team there? Yeah, no dramas, on my way. Yeah, cool. Hey, how was your daughter's birthday the other okay, day? Okay, this is no longer adding value to my work. Call terminated. Hey, is it just me or is Bridie the worst? Oh yeah, everyone hates her. Well, let's roll this fail. Rule number four. Communication should travel via the shortest path necessary to get the job done, not through the chain of command. I think it would be cool to implement casual Fridays. Sure, but smart casual, no shorts. Let me just check that first though with my manager. More business casual than smart casual, but let me just check that with my manager. No t-shirts either, but um, let me just check that with my manager. I think we can think outside the box here. I've got a few ideas, let me just... Uh... Okay, so we're all agreed. Mandatory formal wear on Fridays. Oh, this is stupid. Boss, can we do casual Fridays? Yes. Yes. It's a roll test pass. The verdict? Well, some of these tips are great, and others only work if you're literally a billionaire CEO who can't get fired. Kids, don't try these at work. Hey, out of my office. Sorry, sir. Christ. Yes, leave the drink, please. Thank you. I like to have a drink. This week, New South Wales Ambulance Commissioner Dominic Morgan announced a crackdown on triple-O prank callers, slamming them for wasting the time of paramedics who are only out there to try and save other people's lives. Oh, come on. They're really funny. Check out this one. I dropped my m, &M. You dropped your m, &M? Yep. Right. Do you require an ambulance? Um, if an ambulance could help me pick up my M&M, then, yeah. <laughs> Man, I hope that guy choked on his M&Ms. <laughs> this is a serious problem, not just in New South Wales. Last year, only 10% of the triple O calls made in Queensland were actual emergencies. Now, with this new crackdown, prank callers can face fines of more than $30,000 and even jail sentences. And too right, I say, these people are scum. The absolute worst of them all would have to be famous prank caller Greg Larson, who's been the first to be incarcerated for his behaviour. Tonight they secured an exclusive interview with him behind bars. Prank calls to Triple O are flooding emergency service lines and putting lives at risk, with police promising to hunt down and prosecute offenders. 
But the most famous prank caller, criminal celebrity Greg Larson, aka Pranksy, already lives behind bars. This is his story. Triple O emergency, police fire ambulance. Do you lick a dick a day? Oh, God, yeah, you lick a dick a day. You lick a dick a day. I would say my main inspiration was all my favourite prank callers back in the 90s, you know, like Kyle and Jackie O, and the Jerky Boys, Mr. Fuckabout, the whole lot. I decided if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it right, get into untapped territory. So that's why when I do pranks, I call Triple O exclusively. Weren't you worried that prank Triple O calls would take away resources from real emergencies? The comedy is worth the sacrifice. <laughs> Hello, I am a wog and I have been hit by a bus. OK, so you've been hit by a bus. Do you need an ambulance? No, I will need your mum's phone number because I am a wog and I want to root your mum. <laughs> yeah, that was one of my first prank calls. You gotta realise, back in the 90s, pretty much all Australian comedy was just making fun of Greek accents. So, you know, it was good for its time. The prank where he just farts into the phone for 20 minutes while the triple O operator cried, incredible. But it did kind of go off the rails, you know, when he started chasing the endorsements, the money. I mean, we longed for the fart stuff then. Mm. Yeah, he sold out. Is your Kelvinator bottom-mounted fridge running? Sir, please don't prank us. This is triple O. Yes, I know. I just need to check if your state-of-the-art split-door Kelvinator is living up to the hype. I've lost me way. I had to go back to my roots. The ultimate goal is to get all three emergency services to respond to one prank. Police, fire brigade, ambos. So I cooked up a prank that would blow everyone away. Hello, Triple O. I am a little boy and I'm scared. What is the problem? I have a fever and I'm trapped in a burning house with 12 paedophiles. <laughs> and one of them is Australia's most famous paedophile, Dennis Fergo Ferguson. <laughs> oh, mate, that was brilliant. I mean, you know, obviously in retrospect, I probably shouldn't have given him my actual address. But, you know, it was worth it to see when they rocked up, expecting to see a little boy and 12 pedos sucked in. It's the loosest unit in Australia. You got pranked, dogs. Unfortunately, there was a real fire that night, and due to Greg's prank, people lost their lives. Even though Greg's crimes are unforgivable, he never seemed to learn his lesson. When I was arrested, right, they've gone, Oi, Greg, you get one phone call. <laughs> what do you think's going to happen, you fucking nut? I called up Triple O straight away. I was like, Oi, I know who let the dogs out from the fucking song. You know, the Baja Men song? It was topical at the time. In retrospect, I definitely could have used that one phone call to call a lawyer. Because I got, I got 25 years in prison for, for, for doing a prank call, and I feel like that's... If I had a lawyer, that wouldn't have happened. Really. It seems very excessive. As I said farewell to Pranksy, I couldn't help but think, what a dickhead. What an absolute dickhead. The worst. Absolute scum. Now to deconstructed food. Is it just for toffee-nosed assholes, or can it also be for pretentious wankers? <laughs> The hipster cuisine hit the headlines this week when it turned out a restaurant in Newcastle was serving deconstructed Vegemite toast for $7. Before you judge, let's take a look. What? <laughs> How can they be charging 7 bucks for that? It's Vegemite toast! Mm, actually, because we smeared it on a piece of wood, it's now pronounced Vegemite. <laughs> you can't make Vegemite toast posh, OK? You can't give drugs a fancy facelift by serving deconstructed mess, all right? That's how it works. <laughs> A beautiful smear there. <laughs> One thing's for sure, this deconstructed nonsense is taking over. And it's only a matter of time before the industry goes too far. Good evening. Hello. Table for two, please. Table for two. Yes. There you go. <laughs> Don't forget the Allen key. Enjoy. Welcome to the world's first deconstructed restaurant. No one ever asked for it, and finally, it's here. We were inspired when we saw the deconstructed Vegemite toast selling for about $7, and we thought, why stop at toast? 
One of our more popular dishes is, of course, the famous croque monsieur. Here it is. It's ready to go, table seven, when they've finished it. Mm -hmm. Your croque monsieur. <laughs> we are the truest realisation of deconstruction. Yeah, we're just out to dinner. Actually, I don't know. Excuse me, do you know what this place is called? Even our restaurant's name is the alphabet. You have to put the name together. Deconstruction is more than just a cuisine. It's a philosophy. Anyone can read our 40-page mission statement that we have on the website. And if you don't get it, you're wrong. <laughs> oh, so you ordered the shepherd's pie. In which case, may I be so bold as to recommend the 2020 Pinot Noir? Sorry, 2020? Yes, well, the grapes will take two years to ferment after you've crushed them yourselves. Although, while you're waiting, we can offer you a garlic bread. Some people call it lazy. But what they don't understand is there's a real art to not making what the customer has asked for. And other people say that because we just serve packaged ingredients, we're just a really pretentious supermarket. But would a supermarket have this ambience? Your cheese platter? Appetite. So, how much is all this? Seven hundred dollars. And don't forget to tip. The world's first deconstructed restaurant. We still don't know what it's called. Awful. A stand-up guest for this evening is an award-winning performer who toured across the globe and was stoked to have her with us. She can be found at the Cassie Workman on Instagram. Would you please welcome the wonderful Cassie Workman? <laughs> Oh, oh, hello, hi, hello, hello, how are you, hello, hi, hi. I don't know how to start. I, uh, I've been doing this for 10 years now, I still don't know how to start. Uh, comedians are, are, are a lot like toddlers, I think. Like, every time I do this, I kind of feel like I've just, I've just blundered up to a group of adults and, and interrupted them mid-sentence and, and, and started telling them a story about a bee I saw once or some shit. And, Everybody has to sort of politely endure me, even though Jan's going through a messy divorce and now's not the time. <laughs> so it's good. It's nice to be here. Uh, I should just explain, I, uh, I recently started uh, transitioning from male to female. Uh, so at the moment, I'm making like, like, like 90 cents on the dollar. <laughs> going okay uh, sometimes people say to me oh do you do you miss being do you do you miss being a man fuck no 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 I, I, I miss pockets uh, miss pockets a lot uh, scientists think that uh, they can they can transplant a uterus now they think that's a thing that that they can do uh, for trans women in the near future which is very exciting uh, it's so, still can't sew a pocket into some fucking jeans, though, can they? <laughs> so, I'm not sure how much hope I have for that. Uh, when you are trans, people will ask you about about your junk a lot, you know, which is that's not cool. Don't don't be that person. And it doesn't it doesn't matter anyway, you know. It's it's it doesn't. It, genitals are, are like Mexican food, you know. We we all have the same thing. It's just folded differently. <laughs> I, um, I have a relative who likes to, to mock and misgender me deliberately. That's a, he likes to call me the wrong gender on purpose. So he thinks that's a funny thing to do. Um, and his argument for that is that, well, you know, I knew you when you were young and you were presenting as a boy and you can't just change overnight, you know. And anyway, what sort of pussy is hurt by words? They're just words. I'm just keeping it real. That's what he sounds like, you see. And so... I had to think about that. I thought, well, maybe, you know, maybe he's right. Maybe, you know, because they are, pronouns are just words after all. And, and maybe if I really am a brave person, it shouldn't matter what people call me. So, so I decided to put this theory into practice. Um, 
by by introducing him to my friends as a, a recently released sex offender. <laughs> You'd be surprised. Turns out words actually do matter quite a bit. <laughs> uh, I'm a big fan of dogs. I like dogs. Uh, any dog fans here? <laughs> yes. Oh, excellent. Some woos. Some of you answered in a pitch so high only dogs could hear. And <laughs> They appreciate that. What I love about dogs is that dogs are sincere. A dog can't lie to you, you know, like a, like a dog's face can kind of hide the truth, you know, but its tail just gives everything away. It's, it's genius. You can walk right up to a dog and be all like, do you want to go for a walk, dog? Do you? Uh, you know, and his face is like, whatever, but his tail is like, fuck yeah. That's, uh, that, incidentally, is why dogs chase their tails. Yeah, uh, because if they catch them and eat them, uh, <laughs> they win the power to become nonchalant. <laughs> and, uh, then they can finally go to art galleries, which is good. Uh, I'm not as big a fan of cats. I'm not as big a fan of cats. I don't, I don't own a cat myself, but, but I know a lot of people who do own cats and they all say the same thing. They all say, oh, I love my cat. She thinks she's a human. <laughs> well, that freaks me out. <laughs> what if I am a cat who thinks she's a human? <laughs> Thank you so much.